Are you working on your author career, but struggling to get that first book published? Does the goal of being an author seem too lofty? Or thoughts of having multiple books and making a full-time living are as fantastical as living in Cinderella's castle? Welcome to Discovered Wordsmiths, a podcast where aspiring authors can be heard. Join Steven Schneider as he finds and talks to authors you may not know, but authors that have gotten their foot on the author career path. Hear what they've done to get there and where they want to go now. Settle back. It's time for a bit of inspiration and advice. Come listen to today's Discovered Wordsmith. Uh, okay, so <laughs> where am I? I, I? Usually I have this whole like script because I get a lot of nervous first time <laughs> authors. I don't have that here. Um, so it's kind of like, okay, what do I say now? Um, well, let, let me ask you, uh, when you're writing, what do you use to write? Oh, okay. So that's evolved for me. You know, I started out with nice. Microsoft Word. Um, then I went to Scrivener. Um, you know, Scrivener is, is really good for organizing and managing characters and stuff. But um, I do all, since, since I'm self-published, I do all of my own formatting and stuff. And I do it, in, I do that with Vellum. I'm on, I'm on the Mac. So uh, what usually happens is that I'll start out, I'll get, a, I'll get an idea for a scene or a short story. I'll write that scene and then it ends up growing into the novel. So that happens oftentimes still on Microsoft Word. And then what I'll do is I'll transfer, I'll write them in Word. I run it through um, um, Pro Writing Aid, which is a, a thing that catches the grammar and passive voice and stuff like that. And then I'll copy it and put it into the chapter in Vellum. And I run actually the printout for all of the, the various um, uh, digital copies and stuff so I can pop it into my Apple Books application and, and read it and things like that. And then I'll go back and make fixes that way. So my barf draft, I just let it flow. I don't worry about stuff. If I do see something that needs to happen to set up a scene, I'll go back and fix it. But I kind of do what Patterson does, and that is, is I'll write 100 pages and then go back and look at it and see if it's flowing the way it should, and then I'll write another hundred um, until I get to whatever the number is. I try and I try and make them between seventy and eighty-five thousand words if they're going to be a novel. Um, but I don't stick to that. I, I stop when the story's done. I mean, right, Captain, right. Captain's a shorter book, but it's a better book because I wasn't trying to hit a word count. I was trying to tell a story. Um, and so that's, that's the that's most it. important thing. Yeah. So I, so I write on those things. Uh, pro writing uh, uh, aid is really important. Um, I like that better than Grammarly I um, like and, they, and, and beta readers, right? I mean, I have, a, I have a, a trusted group of beta readers that represent each of the character types <laughs> that are right. in my story. They read, they feed back, I make the changes. And then uh, it goes to, I have a story consultant that I use that helps me make sure my plots are right and that my characters are developing as they should. And then I've got an editor. I have, I have three different editors based, based upon what I'm writing at the given time. And I'll pick one of them, use that. By the time I get it back from them, it's ready to go when it's on Amazon. Cover designer, Bobby Mars, does my covers for um, Vega. Fantastic person. Karen Phillips does um, my, my, uh, my kid stuff. Um, she's really great. And then Casey Ratchford is the illustrator of uh, the Mystery Bug series. Incredible talent. Um, really, really good. And he's not even, he wouldn't consider himself that. He's, he's a, he thinks he's a reformed lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But he's got a gift. So the real, the real key, I think, that you don't necessarily get when you're published by a big five uh, publishing company is that you retain that creative control over, over every piece of your work. That's also the curse because yes. you sink or swim based upon right. your decisions. And so you're I, the only one to blame. Yep. Yeah, I am. I am. But you know, the the interesting thing that I got from Bobby Mars about Vega is she says the readers don't want us. You don't don't show don't ever show um, Jessica's face always show her from the back and she's chasing. So always have her running. So if you look at um, Vega's cover, she's running through a, a part of the Colorado river and you see the person she's chasing her hand coming up out of the water out of her and uh, chasing the captain. She is hanging from a helicopter over yeah. the, um, the uh, London eye. And I had to do that because I wanted to make absolutely sure that all the cops that follow Jess, when they saw that cover, they say, "Hey, he did it! He did put her in Great Britain. This is great." Right. And and it captures, you know, when you look at that cover, 
it, it's you can tell it's not a, a romance. It's not this. She's hanging from a helicopter as the sun is setting over a Ferris wheel. Okay, so there might be some action in this one, I'm going to guess. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And she's holding the biggest, she's holding a Russian revolver, which is the biggest, most powerful handgun ever made anywhere. You know, so... I, what you were asking whether I thought Jess would be better on television or the screen, I always imagine that Paramount Mountain coming up in the beginning That's, of the yeah. book, and um, immediately there's action, right? So in, in, in Vega, we go from Vega killing her first victim to a meth lab bust in progress. In Chasing the Captain, we, we start out with a guy giving his, you know, breathing his last breath, shot six times in an alleyway, in, in um, Seoul, Korea, trying to get a text out. And then we jump to a, a test track where an electric car is going to run the Daytona 500 and some bad things happen. And then Jess ends up chasing somebody 10 years earlier. We do a flashback so we understand how she meets one of the people that starts her on her chase after the captain. So I think all those things as movie scenes and how would they look if I were, if it was Panavision, you know, 16 by nine film aspect ratio 4k color with all with, with um you know I, I do soundtracks too so they the start of chasing vega is um born to be wild you know nice. that's, i think about that and that that really works and the other thing i do is i always do credits so i i actually create the final scene in the book as a movie and then i roll into the credits at the end and it's not something i publish for everybody to see but i have it in a secret place on um on vimeo and I share it with my fellow authors because I want them to understand how many people were involved in the creation. And it is so cool as an author to see that last scene happen. And then bam, a book from a book by Terry from the book by Terry Shepard. You know, if that ever happens to me in a real theater, I probably will have a heart attack and die. <laughs> well, I, I hope I'm next to you because I'd love to see the excitement on that. <laughs> oh, uh, sure. I'll send you the link to it. It's, it's, it's fun. Awesome. It's fun. But it's, it's, it's part of what we do for motivation, right? You think about what motivates you to tell the story. I can't wait to get into the next story after I watch the credits for the last one. Because I always say, like in the Bond movies, James Bond will return in, you know? Right, yeah. I see Jessica good. Ramirez will return in Chasing Karma, January 2022. I got to get that story going, man. Right, yeah, got to get it done because the guys in London want it. <laughs> yeah. I've loved this conversation, my friend. You are, this is a great, yeah, this is a good Thanks time so for having me. And so we were going to talk about, and I think we hit upon it um, a little bit on your choice to become a writer because you haven't been, you know, oh, I always wanted to be a writer. Oh, I worked on it my whole life necessarily. Tell us uh, a little bit about that. Well, the, the short story, it's a very long story, Stephen, but the short story <laughs> is that I've always been one that has wanted to help people reach beyond their self-imposed limitations, break glass ceilings, and do great things. And in my corporate career, that's what I was known for. That's what I always did. And there came a moment in my career where I could no longer do that in that, in that scene. So that left me bereft of purpose. And um, we have the depression gene in our family. And I was suicidal because I thought my life is over. And I talked to my shrink. She convinced me that it wasn't. She said, think of something. The question you always ask is, what would you do if you're working for love and not for money? And I, answer that one yourself. And I couldn't. So she said, well, figure out something, give it a year and see what happens. So I did a lot of soul searching. I knew that I was pretty good as a nonfiction writer. I thought I'd give fiction a try and learn, you know, and I did what I did in everything that I've ever tried. I found the best people in the world, wrote to them, tried to learn from them, hired the best people I could to teach me. And I, I went in with the assumption that I was going to be successful. I already saw myself as Terry Shepard, best-selling author. And that really is what it's about. I mean, it's not about the end. It's about the journey, right? The things that happen during the journey. And so I'm living the life of a best-selling author, although I'm far from it. And part of that life is to try and inspire people with my work to want to become law enforcement people, to want to become, you know, medical examiners, that kind of stuff, to be proud of being gay and also to consider telling their story. Because if a guy at my age can make the shift, a major shift into a fiction genre, learn how to do it, have fun doing it and find purpose in life, I don't care how old you are or where you live, you can do that too. 
and that that's I mean, what else is there to say? That's the most important thing, right? Yeah, I mean, there I, I see so many authors getting so uptight and worried about their writing and their craft and and the imposter syndrome and so many things that they start losing the joy of writing and they don't enjoy it as much. And if you don't enjoy it as much, it shows in your writing for one, but why do it? I used to have a hat when I was a kid said, if it's not fun, forget it. Yeah. And oh, man, that's I, my mantra. We, we must be twins. Twin, twin <laughs> <sides. laughs> but, but through my life, I've lost that. And I rediscovered it this year, actually. And I'm, I'm like, wow, there's so many points in my life and things I do that I don't enjoy. Why am I doing them? You know, I need to do the things I find fun. Uh, and, and it shows it. It, it's a snowball. If you enjoy what you're doing, you're going to do better at it and it'll, the good things will come. The karma will take place. Absolutely. It's cardio. You have to do it. I mean, a couple of authors have told me there's no, you're not allowed to have writer's block. You need to, you need to crank it out every day. And some of it's going to be good. Some of it's going to be bad. That's what Bradbury said years and years ago. I got to meet him when I was in high school because we were studying rocket man and uh, Elton John had this song out at the time. And he happened to be in, the town where I was growing up, we went to see him speak. Amazing guy, super nice guy. And my question was, what's what's the one thing that you think separates the good from the great? And he says, the, the great write every day, even if it sucks. Bam, <laughs> because that was an overall message from this author summit I went to over the weekend, the Career Author Summit. That was like repeated over and over. And I've started to get a new mindset. And I agree. The professional writers, the ones whose their job is writing and they're a professional at it, write every day. Yep. And that doesn't mean you can't be a writer with another job or a part-time writer. You can absolutely be that. But you either you need to make that decision in your head. Am, am I going to always be that and be happy with it? Or am I going to be a professional writer and do what it takes to be a professional writer? And I've made that connection in my head stronger uh recently so well, uh, it's every job has those <laughs> have this dark moments but every job has those moments of flow and you know what i'm talking about Stephen. Yeah, that yeah. time when the muse is singing it's coming through you not from you it's just flowing onto the paper and you you know the last thing i my last edit is narration you know i read it i read it aloud and I, I had put Captain down. I narr I hired a narrator for Vega, but for Captain, I wrote read it myself, and I'd put it down for about a month before doing it. So I'd forgotten about it. I was on the other on my way to something else. And so when I started narrating the thing, my wife like came in and she says, "You're you're at the end of some of these chapters, and I'm hearing you whooping and hollering." And I'm saying, "I'm not that bad. This is pretty good stuff. I love the way it's flowing." And that's great. that's, that's the joy, right? It's got to be internal. You can't you can't Base your joy on how, what other people think, how much you sell, any metric. The only metric that matters in the outside world is what have you done today to make someone else's life better? And the only metric that matters on the inside of, inside of the world is what are you doing to take care of your own mental health, take care and, of you. And, and writing, you can do that for yourself and others. What you were talking about earlier, yeah, helping others, when we were talking about how fiction can help, you know. You, you, you're writing and you feel good and you love it, what you're doing. It comes out, you help others. It's just, I mean, the only other thing I've learned that is this powerful is music. That's the, probably the yeah. only oh, other yeah. thing I would say could be as powerful in people's lives. So now you are a musician, you play, you've actually played? Yes, yes. Uh, I, lots of things. I grew up with piano lessons and yeah. I played drums in school. Uh, I actually got to play a big pipe organ in a church because I took organ lessons. Um, and then I got a rock and roll band. I joined in high school with bass guitar. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, I meet a lot of authors that play music also. And there's a reason for that, I think. Bass <laughs> and drums, man. Those are the two most important things. Absolutely. I mean, after that are the horns, right? <laughs> uh, yes. We horns. need more horns in rock and roll again. Absolutely think we do. So that's part of my past. Another thing we share is that um, I spent the summer of 1972 touring South America with a rock band. And we played uh, everything from small cavern club type venues to soccer stadiums. And it was an oddball moment because there weren't kids our age at that point in time that were doing that. So for, mm. for children, teenagers in that part of the world to come see people that look like them and were their age, 
playing 25 or 6 to 4, MacArthur Park, all that great, you know, oh, late yeah. 60s, early 70s stuff with the horns. They were, it was, it was amazing. It was, it, it actually got me off of one of my dreams, which was to be a session drummer. I wanted to be a session musician for a while. But after touring, <laughs> I learned that that was not what I wanted to do. But I never forgot. And I know you know what this feels like when your band is on stage. Oh, yeah. I don't know what the bass, what the bass tune. There's, 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 everybody's got a tune. Maybe it's um, for the bass players I knew. It was um, uh, Steve Miller. Give me some loving. That's got a great bass part. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, we actually played uh, the chain. Uh, oh yeah, 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 back. yeah, yeah. I mean that, but that moment when everybody recognizes the tune and they recognize that you're the one playing it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the focus is on you, and it's like, it's like the universe takes over, and there's this transmission of energy that's going through you out that out that amplifier and right into their consciousness that there's no no joy better nothing, than that yeah, nothing better i absolutely agree um all right well before we go because i have to go pick a kid up um t- you 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 do podcasting uh you've got a podcast tell us everybody a little bit about that because it ties into this so I feel very lucky to be part of the authors on the air global radio network which is the largest um configuration of podcasts dedicated to the craft that is out there today. Pam Stack is my partner in the, in the um, thing. And I, and I host the, actually the, actually the authors on the air podcast, which is um, the flagship show. And I stumbled into that. She was having some surgery. She needed a sub. She knew I did broadcasting. I filled in for three shows for her. When she came back, she said, you, you've got it. And I was thinking, I don't want to do this. (laughs) What I realized was that there was a very, there was two selfish reasons. One was I now could invite anybody I wanted to, to fill in the blanks in my knowledge base. Yes. The other thing I could do was what you do. This is why I love your show is that you catch people at the dawn of their career and in, in your archive are going to be some people that are going to be literary icons and you'll be able to say, you know, when they do the thing on A&E about their life, they're going to come to you because you met them at the beginning. Absolutely. And I, I love that aspect that, of the show. I, and that, I've said this several times on the show. I've said it to other people. The reason I started this was because uh, several groups on Facebook, you get authors on there going, hey, I just had a great month. I made 120000 And I'm looking at this going, you've got 56 books out, made 120,000 in one month. I'm struggling to get the next sentence and I I can't relate. That's not inspirational to me. And it went click. I bet there's other authors that don't relate and are getting discouraged. I said, so what they need are the authors that struggled through that and got a book out. They have something on the shelf. And what did they go through? I get moms and I get retired lawyers and everything else. And I, I'm hoping that not only are some readers listening and finding new books like yours, which I hope that many do, but also that other authors are listening and going, hey, that sounds a lot like me. And if that guy can do it, I can do it. And and then they get a book out and come on the podcast. You know, and that's that's my goal. That's my hope for this. That's why this is such a successful show, Stephen, is because you're you're in it for a higher purpose. You're not in it for you. You know, all of us authors know that there are very few that are going to make James Patterson bucks. Right. Um, all, many of us have second jobs, um, but we write because we can't not write. It's right. Part of who we are. It's part of what makes it, makes life work for us, and it's connected to our purpose. The best books you can tell are connected to the author's purpose. Yep. And that's why I've been, I was so excited to be on your show, Stephen, because I just love the work you do. And awesome, it's man. fantastic Thank talking you. to you. I really enjoyed yeah, it. I had a great time. So I am coming to Florida in January for a conference I do with my day job uh, programming. Yeah. Uh, I would love to try and meet up with you like on the weekend or something afterwards. Sure. Uh, have Where dinner. will you be? Uh, we are actually in Delray. Okay. Yep. Delray Beach. So, we can, we'll meet halfway. Perfect. We'll figure something out. I want, I want to hear about programming. Are, are, you a, are you a code jockey? Is that what you do? And yep. yep. What, what language? Uh, mostly been using PHP. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. But my I've been doing a lot more administrative stuff. So uh, things have changed a bit. The company's been growing. It's I mean, when I started, there was like eight people and we've got 20 some. So it's good company. 
PHP is great because nobody can see what's going on. It just <laughs> it, it, it generates the HTML. Yeah. You don't know what's happening behind the curtain. That's the I best agree. part about PHP. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Terry. It has been wonderful talking to you. Hopefully we'll catch up sometime again. That'd be great. And everybody, I'll put links to your show. Uh, you know, go listen oh, to thank it. Thank you. It'd be great. Yeah. yeah. Let's do this again. This was great fun. It was just like being to the coffee shop. <laughs> it was. And we need to get to the coffee shops again. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. <laughs> okay, man. Talk to you soon. Have a good right. one. Thank you for listening to Discovered Wordsmiths. Come back next week and listen to another author discuss the road they've traveled and maybe sometime in the near future, it might be you.